Hello, and welcome to the Enneagram in a Movie podcast, part of the Awareness to Action podcast network. This is the podcast that looks at one film in each episode and uses it to explain the nine types and three instinctual biases of the Enneagram model of personality. One movie, one type. My name is Mario Sakura, and I'll be joined by Maria Jose Munita and Tamar Zanatti. We are the principals of Awareness to Action International, a global consulting and training company that specializes in practical applications of the Enneagram. You can find out more about us and our work at awarenesstoaction.com. In the meantime, make some popcorn, sit back, and enjoy the show. Okay, welcome. Uh, here we are talking about Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Enneagram Type 7. I'm Mario Sakura, and as always, here with Maria Jose Monita. Hi, Mar- Maria Jose. Hi, Mario. Hi, Becky. All right. And with us, we also have special guest Becky Gorman, who is an associate with Awareness to Action. Uh, how are you, Becky? I'm great. All right. So, uh, Becky, uh, you may recognize her voice as we go. She does one of the uh, commercials uh, that we use. So, And she has the, uh, the joy of being an Enneagram Type 7. So uh, she will have some insights into uh, what it is to be a 7 and how it's reflected in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So, so let's get right to it. Okay. So, um, again, I always just like to remind people that when we talk about these movies, we are not necessarily talking about characters, but we are talking about the overall theme of the movie. And I think that overall theme of sevenness, which we will define momentarily, uh, is reflected throughout this movie. Okay. So, before we get to our impressions of the movie, uh, first of all, let me ask the two of you do you agree that you see the Enneagram Type 7 in this movie? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good, good. So, Enneagram Type 7, we call striving to feel excited. What's interesting about Ferris's day off is that it's not really a day off, right? I mean, it's a pretty action packed day uh, that, that goes through it. So, for anybody who is not familiar, with the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. We are sticking with our theme of movies from the last millennium uh, here on the Enneagram in a Movie podcast. We don't like anything that has been done after 2000. I'm so glad you said it. (laughs) (laughs) Because I was about to say something about it. (laughs) I was going to say about uh, that it was, they were from the last century. So last millennium. Even last millennium. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And for uh, for perspective, it is actually four years older than the producer of this podcast, uh, Seth Creekmore. So uh, so, it, you know, it's kind of an old movie, but uh, it's it's a good movie. And I think it reflects what we wanted to talk about today. Okay, so for those of you who have not seen the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off stars Matthew Broderick. It was uh, released in 1986 and it was written and directed by our old friend. John Hughes, who was also the writer and director of The Breakfast Club. And in fact, the high school used in the movie is the same high school used in The Breakfast Club. And I think they were shot back to back. Right? So um, uh, they just kind of a lot of the same crew. And as we'll see, they almost used a lot of the same actors. Right? So there's some interesting things to talk about with casting. But uh, the, the, the quick overview of the movie is that Ferris Bueller, played by Matthew Broderick, uh, has an uncanny skill of cutting classes and getting away with it. Intending to make one last duck out before graduation, Ferris calls in sick, borrows a Ferrari, and embarks on a one-day journey through the streets of Chicago. On Ferris's trail is high school principal Rooney, played by Jeffrey Jones, determined to catch him in the act. Okay, Uh, we'll talk a lot more about the movie, but that's a quick overview. Enneagram Type 7. So uh, when we talk about the seven, we talk about the strategy of striving to feel excited. Uh, Maria Jose, tell us about the strategies in Type 7. So when we talk about the strategies, we look at them as trying to understand their logic. And their logic starts with desire to feel a particular way. And in this case, for Type 7, striving to feel excited. That emotional need or that feeling need makes seven think in particular ways. Think about all the things that could be exciting or feel exciting and probably avoid the things that don't feel exciting. 
and that impacts the the way they behave, how they act. So so they tend to be upbeat, kind of cheerful, curious. They kind of add this energy to their environment. They they um, they have this spark. Yeah. There's an ability to energize. Yes, I think, you yeah. Know, what, you're, what you're getting, and certainly we see that in Ferris Bueller, right? Yeah. So, so, so and they ahead, do this in adaptive and maladaptive ways, and we'll yes. see. I think both in the movie, for sure. Uh, some sometimes that logic or pattern shows up in good ways and not that good ways. So right, yeah. right. So before you tell us about the connecting points, Maria Jose, Becky, from the perspective of a seven. Tell us about striving to feel excited. It's just so automatic. It's just, it's almost insane the more you begin to notice how many ways a type seven can strive to move toward excitement. It, and it, it's not just uh, the party kind of feel that people talk about, but the excitement of a new idea. Uh, something, the excitement of something looks beautiful, tastes fantastic. I always think of all of the senses when I think of myself and think of type seven, because you can get excited about any part of your senses in any way in life and the stimulation of that. And although it's, it's natural to us, I think it's also gets exhausting to us sometimes. And we don't even realize we're exhausted by it. And to other people. And I say this as someone who lives with three sevens, right? So, uh, right. So, so I get it. And, uh, you know, obviously I adore sevens and, but, um, but yeah, they have this energy that can be, you know, tiring. And we see that in Ferris Bueller's day off as well. You could see him exhausting the, the people around him. Right. So good. Uh, I think one of the things we want to get up front real quick is this assumption that sevens are always happy right that they're always optimistic that they're always positive and that's certainly not my experience of sevens comment on that becky well um mario's absolutely true it's so it's so real because we get the expectations of something built up in our minds and and even in our emotions before it happens and how many times the reality falls flat from the expectations it's very disappointing that disappointment comes out in complaining or disgruntledness or something that this just isn't good enough this isn't okay i think that's a big factor of i thought this would be better right i thought this would taste better i thought this would be more fun i thought this would be more interesting and so i'm a little disappointed with what's happening and i want to move on to the next thing uh, maria jose tell us about the connecting points so for type seven um their preferred strategy is striving to feel excited as we said and the neglected strategy is uh, striving to feel detached in their minds detached feels like they could miss out on something that they could lose or um not have the opportunity to enjoy something that, that could be exciting and they don't want to do that. But on the other hand, they feel drawn to that and they need some detachment. And we'll see that at the end of the <laughs> of the movie. And the support strategy is striving to feel perfect. And when sevens try to... Feel, so there's a, like a little perfectionist in every seven that I know. And the certain things have to be perfect. And... And also they want to give uh, the impression of like a good boy or a good girl so that they leave them alone. So they don't, I don't have to almost waste time or l lose the opportunity of doing something because I've been told that it's not correct or something. So it's like, I want to behave well enough so that they leave me alone. Right. And, you know, I want to say that to me is a really key point. It's it's a little different than wanting to be perfect. It's wanting to get rid of anything that <laughs> slows me down or limits my expectation or enjoyment of something, mm -hmm. my own life, my, my own yeah. choices. Yeah, it's it's not. And again, we always talk about this when we talk about the connecting points, but it's not like a seven becomes a one, mm -hmm. you know, when, when they go there. It's that they use this strategy, but in a seven-ish way. Right. So they they use it to make things OK around them so they can get back to being excited. You know, and, and for me, too, there's this, I think, mythology that sevens are these wild party people, you know, who, uh, you know, overdo everything and are always getting into trouble and all that. But in my experience, it's not kind of the 
trouble we'll see with an eight, for example. It's, you know, it's, right, it's, it's, it's more subtle and it's the kind of trouble that makes it hard for people to get mad at them. Right. Because there's this there's this sort of lovability to it, this uh, lack of malice that comes through. Right. They're just looking to have a good time. Right. To, to, to find what's good in life. And, you know, sometimes it means they might bend or break the rule a little bit, you know, but there's never any ill intention toward it. Not like Bender in the uh, no, exactly, exactly, <laughs> breakfast club. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, I would do things outside the rules in order to have my enjoyment and my fun. Yes. I didn't want it to affect anyone else. Right. <laughs> so this is this is really an, a good point here, Becky. I'm I'm glad that you said that. And I want to I want to talk about kind of the classical enneagram, right? So we always like to to check in on the classical enneagram when we talk about this. And the the classic uh, vice of the seven is gluttony. Okay, so it's this overindulgence, and it's usually talked about as overindulgence regarding food, but that's not the case. It's just this over, you know, this need for more stimulation. And I was reading a little bit about gluttony and a, a definition of it, and so it's overindulgence and overconsumption of food, drink, or, or wealth items, particularly as status sim symbols. Okay, which again, I don't really think of as strictly a seven thing, but then it says something interesting. In Christianity, it is considered a sin if the excessive desire for food causes it to be withheld from the needy. Okay, And so if we extend that to all the things that the seven might be sort of gluttonous for, it's always, you know, they, they don't have this intention to take away from others, right? It's almost like they're, they're sharing you know, or they want to share their good feelings and abundance, right? So, um, so I think that's an important distinction there, right? It's not about I, I, I want what you have, right? Or I'm going to take from you. It's hey, let's just all have fun here. Let's just all experience things. Exactly, absolutely, exactly. In, in fact, you know, women sometimes can get to competitive about clothing. Uh, oh, well, she has that really cool thing. And oh, or I have a cool thing. I shouldn't tell him. No, I just want it too. I don't care yeah. that you don't. I mean, you should have <laughs> right. it, but I want it too. Great. So, and, and, and again, we see this in Ferris, right? As, as we go through this movie, right? He's not, you know, he wants to take people with him on his day off okay number one it makes it more fun with him right uh, cameron has the car right and his girlfriend is his girlfriend so it's more fun that way but it, you know you don't get the sense that he's necessarily being selfish in and, his activities and he says so he he has a story in his mind of like why he's taking them with him yes and what's the benefit for that they will get yes so the um fixation of the seven is planning Right. It's this idea of always thinking about what could we do next? Right. What else can we do? What are my options? We could do this. We could do this. We could do this. Right. And there's so many fun things to do, but it becomes a problem when it's all about planning in your head rather than experiencing what you're doing. Yeah. Right? And this, this is where it becomes a fixation is that I can't be here right now because I want to be there. Right, I want to go somewhere else. And in that in that sense, I think that the movie does a good job in showing him at least enjoying what they were doing. It was yes. not only about what's coming next. In fact, they never talk about what's coming next. Right. They show them where they <laughs> are, and yeah. we don't know where they're going until they're there. Good. So there is, um, in this movie, I think, it actually captures some of the really high side of the seven, right? The, this, I, like you said, of being in the moment, right? I, I'm going to want to talk later about the scene at the museum, right? Where, you know, there, there's clearly this, uh, this is illustrated. But so, so planning is the fixation. The virtue of the seven is sobriety. Um, and I was looking at the de the definition of sobriety, and it says not intoxicated. Okay, so that's you know that's that's a good start. Okay, it's kind of about this ability to step back and take perspective, right? It's about this ability not to be all caught up in you know the 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 the, the dynamics of what are happening in the moment and responding to the world, you know, frantically. 
but by stepping back and paying attention and seeing what's happening. Which involves slowing down. And in yes. fact, he refers to that, not quite in this way, but I just don't know how to do sobriety without slowing down. Yes. And that's yes. quite the practice for the seven. Yes, and that's that's one of the signature lines from the movie. You know, life happens really fast, and if you don't take a little time to, um, I'm going to have to um, drop in the, the the exact quote now. But if you don't step back and pay attention, you know, it passes you by, right? So, so Ferris is somebody who is, um, you know, who is good at skipping school, right? He has he is in the in the midst of his ninth sick day from school it's his last year of high school it is the end of the year and uh he needs a day off he says right because he figures you know what i'm not going to get many more of these and for me what this movie really represents is the loss of innocence the loss of freedom right the loss of you know kind of the joy in life because if we think about the adults in the movie Right. None of them come across, you know, John Hughes was not kind toward adults in his movies, right, either in The uh, Breakfast Club or, you know, any of his other movies, but certainly not in this one. I mean, everybody, every every person over 20 years old in this movie is pretty despicable, right, uh, for the most part. So uh, so it really kind of represents this idea that this is my last chance for freedom and excitement and fun and innocence before everything changes once I get out of high school. And he must have done a lot of planning there because it, every detail was taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So there is a bit of planning, right? So the day might not have been planned, but his um, his excuses were really, really well planned. I mean, he went through a lot of effort to make this, you know, to not get caught, yeah. uh, including sound effects and kind of, a, uh, you know, a, a, a Rube Goldberg, you know, way of kind of uh, propping, you know, turning over a mannequin when the parents open the door and all these things. Orchestrated right? beyond belief. Yes, yes. Uh, digital sound effects <laughs> on his, you know, electronic keyboard and all these sort of things, right? So, um, yeah, so a very clever planning sort of person in that way but doing all of that so that he could go out and have fun right and so this again is where we get to this idea of I, i've got to perfect my story right i've got to get this exactly right i got to get all the, the the trickery in place you know perfectly so people leave me alone i can go do whatever awareness to action offers a unique approach to applying the enneagram professionally with leaders and organizations, as well as for personal development. What makes us stand apart is our Enneagram expertise and focus on understanding human nature. We know people because we see people. And this is a skill set that can be taught and learned. Human nature is complex and simple at the same time. Our mission is to help people see clearly and act accordingly. Why? Because the ability to see ourselves and others clearly and honestly is essential. It enables us to act in more adaptive and useful ways. The Multicultural Team and Awareness to Action will help you learn tools and practices to become more aware and also to understand and engage people more effectively. Learn more at awarenesstoaction.com. Join us at 2021 for exciting learning opportunities. Let's talk a little bit about the movie first, Bueller's Day Off, uh, released in 1986, as we said, written and directed by John Hughes. It was a very successful movie financially, right? It made $70 million on a budget of $5 million. And as we have said before, first of all, that's $1986, which is about, I don't know, two, $3 billion today. No, I'm joking, but it's a lot of money, right? And, uh, you know, a typically for a movie to be profitable, it has to make back twice its budget. And this one, you know, so was certainly very, very profitable on that. And really uh, helped matthew broderick become a star um tell me what was your reaction to matthew broderick in this uh in this movie i was taken about how sweet his face looked how there was just this endearing quality to the just a countenance that seemed soft and and sweet in his eyes and his his cheeks everything just you couldn't i couldn't help but smile 
just looking at him, even though he was doing things that also sometimes disgusted me <laughs> and embarrassed me as a fellow right. seven. Yeah. How about you, Maria? Was it? Yeah, I felt like there was a disconnect. So I agree with Becky, but there was a disconnect between that kind of uh, sweetness and the things he was doing. Yes. Uh, so he was doing sevenish things, but it didn't convince me completely as a seven character and it doesn't need to be but he was just too sweet you yep. know too, too, too sweet to be a seven is what you're saying yeah i'm not that. saying that sevens are not <laughs> sweet but i think their sevens are good people i mean i'm not saying that they are not but this guy was just too nice and like floating in the air you know there was this thing and to me there's i don't know i don't know maybe more sharper astute that he was behaving that way but he didn't feel that way you yeah. know so this is a good example of when the enneagram type of the actor gets in the way of the enneagram type of the character right mm -hmm. because my thought is that matthew broderick is probably a nine Okay. And if you look at most of his movies, he plays a nine. In fact, one of the movies we considered talking about was the movie Election, uh, where he plays a great nine character. So I agree. It, it, for me, it was kind of a nine playing a seven. And so when he was able to sort of embody the character, it came across as seven-ish, but there was this sort of nine-ish feel to the character. And John Hughes, when he wrote the character wrote it specifically with uh, matthew broderick in mind because he said i need this person to be likable right because he does some things what make you think he's a jerk and only a handful of actors in his mind could have done it he said you know jimmy stewart as a teenager could have played this role right but not many other people besides uh, matthew broderick so he felt he didn't want the character to feel like you know to make you feel like he was reaching for your wallet okay? <laughs> so he used matthew broderick and i think it works for the movie but it also sort of works against the enneagram type a little bit yeah, I'm glad to hear both of you say that because I had trouble identifying with him at, at times, feeling like, well, this, is, this isn't, just doesn't quite feel right. And at one point, there's a scene where he actually, by his dress and behavior, looks like a three. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's too polished for the way sevens traditionally <laughs> behave. Right. Yeah, so, so there was that element, and there was uh, also kind of hard to tell whether he was a transmitting subtype or a navigating subtype, right? Kind of floated back and forth between the two. And again, I think it's because Matthew Broderick is probably a navigating nine, and the character was meant to be kind of transmitting, right? Yeah, so, he was doing transmitting seven stuff. Yes. But behaving yes. like uh, navigating nine. Yes. But I, and, you know, and I also want to say, so we could criticize this, I think, from a enneagrammatic perspective, but I think the character works, right? I yeah. mean, I think, you know, it is kind of an iconic character in movies. And I think there's reason for it, right? Because it is, you know, of what it captures. Mm -hmm. Good. So he was the only person kind of considered for that. Uh, the, his best friend named Cameron is played by uh, Alan Ruck, who has gone on to have a good career as a character actor in TV series. And he was also in Speed and you know a number of other movies. But somebody who was originally considered um, uh, for that role was Emilio Estevez, who <laughs> played Brian in uh, The Jock in the breakfast club and and the character the, the the actor who played cameron alan brock also tried to try out for the character of bender in the mm. breakfast club so imagine cameron playing bender no. it doesn't work for me no, right the, no. the, the, that doesn't work at all. So, so an interesting bit of, of um, casting. Also, the girlfriend, uh, played by Mia Sarah, it was interesting because uh, Alan Ruck was 29 when they made the movie, right? Playing a senior in high school. And John Hughes wanted an, uh, an older actress to play Mia, uh, to play um, Sloan, Sloan, the girlfriend. Uh, but she was only 18, right? Everybody thought she was much older uh, when she went in for the uh, the audition. Uh, some interesting kind of crossover. Molly Ringwald wanted the role of Sloan, Molly Ringwald from The Breakfast Club. But according to some reports, she didn't get it because she wasn't 
as pretty as Mia Sara. Uh, Molly Ringwald says that uh, they talked her out of taking the role because it was too small for her. Right. So, um, uh, you know, uh, who knows what really happened, but an interesting uh, thing. So, yeah. Um, and and Emilio Estevez's brother, Charlie Sheen, yeah. is in the movie. Yes. Makes a great cameo role. Good, good pickup there. It was a p- critically praised movie, although there was some criticisms of it. Got a, thir- a 79% rating on. Rotten Tomatoes, but a 92% audience scale, meaning that the audience tended to like it more than the critics did. Uh, Some of the positive reviews, one of them that caught my attention, here is a dream as old as adolescence, and it is fun to be reminded of its ageless potency, especially in a movie as good-hearted as this one. Okay, Some interesting social commentary about the movie at the time that I wanted to touch on. So a, a movie critic named Richard Roper, who's a pretty big name movie critic, says it's one of the best comedies ever made. Uh, he said it's the movie he has watched the most times, and he even had his license plate say S.V. Ferris for Save Ferris. So he's a real big Ferris Bueller fan, right? It seems a little odd to me, but, you know, it's a good movie. But, you know, I mean, I'm not yeah, going to live my life much. around it. It's a bit much. And there was one other quote I want to. Uh, yeah, George Will, the conservative columnist, who was, I thought, a very interesting person to, to uh, chime in on this movie, said that um, it's the moviest movie. A film most true to the general spirit of movies, the spirit of effortless escapism, right? Uh, which I thought is interesting because this movie is about escape, right? Mm-hmm. It's about escaping from school. It's about escaping from adulthood. It's about being on the run. So interesting observation there from him. Okay, They don't picture school. Very interesting. <laughs> no, well, that's which takes us to some of the other cast members, right? So, uh, so, so Ben Stein, uh, the famous uh, economics professor in the movie, who you know, when we think of cultural impact of the movie, his line of Bueller, Bueller, right? When he was taking attendance, is a famous one. So, uh, if you lived in the U.S. for about twenty years, you know, every time somebody took attendance. Somebody would say Bueller, right? It kind of became a thing. And I don't know if you noticed this, but when he was doing the role, there were like four or five A's and then five or six B's. And then it went right to like J, right? Or something, you know, it's like, you know, we got to skip over this, right? So, um, so there was that. But a quick story about Ben Stein. So Ben Stein actually was a staff writer for Richard Nixon when he was president. And Nixon introduced him to a New York Times columnist named William Sapphire, right, who introduced him to a studio executive who introduced him to John Hughes. And John Hughes being one of the only other three or four Republicans in Hollywood decided that he would use Ben Stein in a movie the first chance he got. He had never acted before and went on to become an actor and a media commentator and even a game show host at some point. So he built quite a uh, career off of that chance mm-hmm. encounter. Right? Uh, so his, uh, when he was giving the economics lecture about the Hoot Smalley Act, which kicked off the Great Depression, the, the students listening to it all started cheering and clapping when he was done. And he originally thought it was because they were so impressed with the lecture, but realized it was because they were just thrilled that he stopped talking. Right? <laughs> so, right? <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, uh, to me, it's also... Um, addressing the thing about boredom and how sevens want to just avoid feeling bored and they made it look as boring as possible i think yes. and they made a good job <laughs> yes the the literature professor was not much more interesting right so the, yes the students were bored out of their minds throughout the movie yeah they made that right. very clear <laughs> yes so some people see this as john hughes's Best movie? Uh, I'm not so sure I'd go quite that far. You know, it was following The Breakfast Club and 16 Candles, and uh, so he was having a a real hot moment there. Uh, As we said, it is about this last moment of innocence, uh, kind of this last chance for joy. And it made me think of Peter Pan. Right, except that a uh, Peter Pan who knows he's going to grow up someday and is trying to resist it as much as he can. I was also intrigued by the theme of cars as representing freedom. 
right? Uh, the Ferrari uh, represented the ability to get away. I mean, he he whined throughout the movie that all he wanted for his birthday was a car, but his sister got a car and he got a computer, right? right. And so it was, you know, and uh, he, he said, how's that for being born under a bad sign, right? Now, this kid lived in a pretty nice area, right? He, you, this kid had a good life. Okay, uh, very much an upper middle class, wealthy area, uh, but he saw this as this, you know, unfairness in life, which I think kind of can sometimes speak to the expectations that sevens might have about how much better things could be, you know, at times like, you know, yeah, this is good. But man, if I only had a car, right, or if I only had this, or if I only had that. Well, it, that's true. And I, I, what struck me as you were saying that is I resonate with that. And I also, I'm always curious of, about how that is different than type four, who's looking at what's not enough. But it may be that we're looking to additive. What could make this more and better and uh, bigger and whatever we want versus, although that has an element of something missing, yeah. there's a different futuristic feel to it i guess yeah yeah and which which goes to show you that you know there's a lot of nuance in the enneagram at the heart of what's happening right at of the at the heart of our fixations and our and our our vices there's there's a lot of uh, not so much overlap as subtle distinctions one to the other mm -hmm. but the manifestation of it in the expression of behavior and thoughts and emotions can be dramatically different. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's a good thing. They're very similar, but different in that way. We like to look at different scenes for the movies. And so, uh, you know, for me, the opening scene is the first one we talk about. It is where Ferris is setting up his sick day, right? And he is crafting his story. Okay. Uh, before I tell you what, before we go, that the one thing I didn't ask you is general reactions to the movie. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with you, Becky. General reaction to the movie: Did you like it? Did you not like it? Was it okay? Well, okay. Here's the honest truth: I put off watching this movie for decades. I, <laughs> people have said, "Hey, have you watched Ferris Bueller?" No, and I have no zero zero interest in doing so. Well, so I did, and at first I cringed. I thought, mm -hmm. ah, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this thing. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, I became much more intrigued by how it was unfolding and what I could see in there, especially focusing on the type seven. And as it went on, then I saw nuance that I could tap into that really were quite moving at times for me. Yeah. So I ended up, um, it's not my favorite movie. I wouldn't yeah. have a license plate with that on it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it went better than I thought it would. Okay. Good, good. Uh, Maria Jose. It was not on my <laughs> radar. Uh huh. Uh huh. Not a big um, movie in, in, in Santiago when you, you were coming up? Which day? When did it the come 1986. Out? 1986. Yeah. Not that I remember. I had heard of, heard of it, but um, I was seeing the pictures, the, the poster. And I had a similar reaction to Becky when I, to Becky's when I started watching it. But then I started to enjoy it. The guy, I mean, the whole thing, which is sweet and lovable and, I mean, likable. And yeah. and there was more to it than a superficial, typical U.S. school, like the typical movie. I think there was more to it. And there were dreams and there was friendship and in a really deep way. And, and the suffering, I think that there's something about how the characters kind of deal with life and so i enjoyed it so i think it's an easy movie to underestimate right uh, mm. because if you watch it as kind of a slapstick comedy it's like okay yeah this is funny you know it's okay right but when you when i was reading about john hughes and the writing of this movie he said for me it was all about the characters and what they ended up doing was unimportant, right? The, the plot didn't matter. It was about exploring the characters. And I think it's, it's easy to overlook the nuance of the characters and the, the emotional things happening under the surface. 
Okay. Um, so I watched this movie twice. Prior, I mean, I've seen it before, but I watched it twice in preparation for the podcast. And the first time I watched it, I, you know, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, it was, it was fine. You know, not a great movie. And then when I was watching it again, I really started to tune in to some of the, uh, the characters and the messages and I, and I found it quite moving. So, um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I like it. Now, uh, if you start to look at the logic of the movie, it kind of falls apart, right? Because in order to do all of those things that they did, you know, would have to be you know, Ferris Bueller's week off, right? Because they covered, you know, they covered a lot of ground. But I think if we can set that aside, it's a sweet movie. Yeah. yeah. All right. So he um, he decides he's going to take a day off because, Becky, you said you had the quote for what he says. Yes. Uh, Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And that's the whole idea. He just says, you know, there's stuff happening out there and I want to go and see it. And, you know, quite frankly, I could relate to that. I remember my times you know in junior high of saying you know what i can't go do this another day i'm hopping on the train and going into the city i can say that because my kids won't listen to this podcast and i kill them (laughs) for doing that but so so i i can relate to that you know of hey there's something else out there right and i don't want to miss it and to me that kind of gave me an insight of the motivation to be curious about life you know so if i'm not if I don't have my eyes open, I'll miss out on something that might yes. be great. Yes. So yes. I'm looking, you know, I'm interested in looking at things because there are things that are exciting. Yes. And when he opens the curtains in the beginning of the movie, right, he, t- he gives that quote and then he goes to the window and he opens the curtains and you see these beautiful blue skies and the, the clouds and all these things. And you just know that this is pulling toward him. Okay, so he has to convince everybody that he actually is sick, right? So he sets up this elaborate scheme. He explains he one of the the interesting things about this movie is that he breaks the fourth wall, right? Meaning that he turns and talks directly to the audience at times, or he'll kind of you know there'll be these little scenes where he'll sort of look at the audience and kind of smile or smirk or something, right? So it builds this intimacy with the uh, with the audience, but you know he does this elaborate hoax on you know with a mannequin in the bed and all these strings and all these electronic sound effects and all these pre-recorded messages and all these things uh, that he does. I don't know if you guys noticed it, uh, but th- there was the scene where his mother came back to check on him and the mannequin pops up and the mannequin is brown, right? Which yeah. Ferris Bueller is not. And, you know, there's this scene where the brown arm is sticking out from the blanket. And I'm thinking, how unaware is this mother? You know? Yeah, well, I, to me, that was also a kind of savage thing in that I don't want to know. With, from the mother, you, yes. yes. Yes, from the mother. It's, yes. You know, it's so much better to feel good about it and not want to know. And, and look, this is not just a seven thing. I think a lot of parents uh, would prefer not to know about certain things about, um, I mean, regarding their kids. Yes. But, uh, but it is, it could be seen as a seven-ish thing. Yes. And you could see the idealism in everybody. That yes. whole concept of making things look better to myself than they may be. Yes. yes. We all touch that. Yes. Except for uh, the genie. The, uh, the, well, genie. Okay. So there's genie, his sister. Uh, probably kind of, I don't know, maybe an eight, maybe a four, you know, couldn't quite tell, yeah. you know, but, you know, she was the, you know, she was the darkness to Ferris's light, right? And mm-hmm. the angry, hostile and jealous, you know, sibling who, you know, wanted to expose him. She knew he was faking it and she wanted to make him uh, pay for it, as well as the um, the school principal, right? Who we'll get to in a moment, okay? <laughs> uh, but, um, all right, so... Again, Ferris is, you know, frustrated that he doesn't have the car. Uh, So in order to make his dreams come true for the day, he has to call his friend Cameron, who does have a car. Cameron, again, played by Alan Ruck, who is a sort of hypochondriacal type six, right? Who Mm. thinks he's sick, thinks he's dying. He happens to be homesick as well. Ferris calls him. 
says, look, you're not dying. Get over here in the car, you know, come take me here, right, et cetera. And each time he calls Cameron to convince him to get over, Ferris is doing something different, right? He's sitting by the pool with a fruity drink. He's dancing to the to uh, the theme song of I Dream of Jeannie, you know, and all these sort of things. So there is that relationship. And even that line that Ferris said where he says, you're not dying. You just can't find anything good to yes. do. Yes, wonderful line. Right. Yeah, and it's this attempt to just get what I want, you know? So I'll insist until I get what I want. Yes. So I'll keep yes. calling you. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, y- you know, and there's this, also Cameron says in bed that he's dying, right? Which at first, you know, you don't think too much of until later in the movie, right? So Cameron does sort of represent what happens when we're beaten down by life right he has very he has an indifferent mother right who's off you know somewhere traveling and apparently a very overbearing father who doesn't pay attention to him and so he feels dead right he feels like you know Mm -hmm. life has been beaten out of me already and throughout the movie ferris helps him come back to life kind of joyless and without the freedom and the unlimited feeling that that sevens are striving to experience. So um, finally, Cameron is convinced to um, almost despite leave. himself. Yes, he <laughs> he you know he's out in the front yard and he's kind of torn. Do I go? Do I not? And he's going to go in his own beat up old car, uh, which I think he does at first. Uh, to he, he goes over to um, uh, to Ferris's house, and then they decide they're going to plot to get Ferris's girlfriend Sloan out of school. So that the three of them can go and they fake Sloane's grandmother dying. Yeah. So, so before that, I, another thing that I saw in Ferris is how he's just not only doing different things all the time, but going from one thought to another, one idea to the other and jumping and jumping and jumping. And it's just nonstop. Yes. And, and that's very seven-ish as well. It's like these ideas and jump from one to another. And it's just, a bit tiring to follow at times. <laughs> that was exactly the word in my head. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. And, and so every time they cut back and forth between Ferris and another character, Ferris is dressed differently, doing something different, right? I mean, the, the, to your point, uh, absolutely. So there are some phone calls back and forth with the school principal, and the principal who has decided. I'm going to get this kid. I cannot have 1,500 kids lionizing or making a hero out of Ferris Bueller. I have to do something about this. He calls the mother who is defending him as, no, he's really sick. And he says to her, Mrs. Bueller, uh, wake up and smell the roses. He's leading you down the primrose path. And then when they cut to Ferris after that, Ferris is playing clarinet. Okay, sitting on the bed playing the horn, right, the clarinet, and he says, "Never had a lesson, right?" That's, you know, right? But you know, <laughs> who would have thought? But, <laughs> yeah. but the interesting thing about there, and again, I'm always reluctant to read too much into a movie, but it made me think of the Pied Piper, right? What is Dean Rooney concerned about that? You know, he's going to lead all the children down the wrong path, and they cut to first, and what's he's doing? Playing a horn. <laughs> you know, like the Pied Piper did, you know, as he's trying to, you know, lead people down the path. So, uh, you know, it establishes Dean Rooney as not a very nice person, as kind of crazy, kind of uh, messianic in his attempt to instill discipline on Ferris. He does not believe that Sloane's grandmother really died and says, you know, well, why don't you just roll the dead body in here so we can see, you know, uh, then they convince him that he's actually, that's real and he freaks out and all this sort of stuff. Okay, so. Yeah, he's um, trying to, he's trying to be funny, but, or not funny, but. uh, Clever. He's trying to be clever. Clever. Yeah. Doesn't get him far. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it did. Yes. So once he comes to believe that it really is Sloane's father, even though it's not on the phone, uh, he becomes very apologetic. And at this point, because Cameron said on the phone that they would pick her up and please you be out there escorting her. Now Ferris is saying, hey, we can't pull up in your piece of junk car. We have to use your father's priceless, only 100 made 1961 Ferrari coupes, right? Which means he has to convince 
Cameron of that, and they go in this very expensive, very fancy car to go and pick up Sloan. Which again, the the car represents freedom, and this amazing car represents the true joy of freedom. And he even says, you know, look, if you had access to this car for the day, would you take it back? No, of course you wouldn't. I'm not going to. So they plan to use the car. Okay. And not just a car, but with the top down. I was yes. stuck with that total freedom, throwing yes. things out as they wish. Yes. Yes. And there was the scene, too, where when they do pick up the girl, um, Ferris is dressed as a as a father with a hat and a, a raincoat and all these sort of things. She runs up to him. They start kissing, unlike father and daughter uh, in any family that I've ever seen, I hope. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and she gets into the car and they go zooming off and she yells, woohoo, as they drive away, apparently on route to her grandmother's funeral right so uh, kind of made me think of uh, almost famous when the the daughter leaves the mother and the yeah. car goes screeching off to represent freedom as well yeah and he said something like come on live a little yeah so so when uh cameron was all stressed because of using the car and speeding and all of that and feeler i mean and ferry says yeah come on live a little and it's about living life you know yes. as, as becky says savoring life you know yes yes when when dean rooney is talking to his secretary you know who is trying to help him but also you could see she kind of likes ferris right she points out that all the kids love ferris in the school and she starts listing all the cliques you know the dweebs the nerds the stoners the jocks and you know you know the shop kids they all love him they think he's a righteous dude right you know which pisses off dean rooney and at one point he said you know well he's trying to make a fool of me and all this and she says yeah he makes you look like an asshole <laughs> so, so so it sets up this conflict now l let me ask you guys what enneagram type would you have suggested that dean rooney was oh dear he was such a mess <laughs> well, yeah, so so whatever he was, he was not uh, you know indicative of a healthy version of that. I, I think we can agree on that. Okay. That's right. All right. Um, he was so into control and 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 winning this whole situation. I kind of played around with one, but there was something about it that I wasn't quite sure about. That it was just his obsession with winning this kid that the battle with this kid but it, it, it he looks like javert in a really poor version of yeah. javert but yeah. it, so he could be a one but a really clumsy one yes a, a very clumsy i think transmitting one right mm -hmm. you know from my view and the javert is a great reference right for the you know javert from les miserables the police officer who chased jean valjean for 20 years for stealing a loaf of bread right mm -hmm. so very good in comparison are you interested in learning more about our approach to the enneagram go to awareness to and check out our certification program we offer a clear concise business-friendly and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment, including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. It is currently being conducted virtually and combines live sessions with asynchronous learning. Again, find out more at awarenesstoaction.com. So there's something uh, when they uh, take Sloan out of school and he, she says, uh, what are we going to do? And he says, what aren't we going to do? Yes. <laughs> it's like there are yes. all these options and we're going to do everything. Yes. 
Yes. I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. So um, so they head off in the Ferrari to Chicago. Um, and uh, Chicago is one of the great cities in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's it's a it's a beautiful city. It's a fun city. The people are nice and down to earth. And um, John Hughes said that this movie was his love letter to the city of Chicago. And and you can certainly see that in the scene when they are driving into the city and there are all these shots of the skyline and the different buildings and they're riding along Lake Shore, if it's an avenue or boulevard, I can't remember now, but riding along the lake there in the Ferrari and just experiencing again this bliss and freedom that they have. So it really is a nice ode to the city of Chicago. And so the first thing they do is, well, they go to the garage because they have to put this priceless car somewhere cameron is not happy about taking this to a parking garage in downtown chicago but they are sure to rightly, ah, so. rightly, so. rightly, <laughs> rightly so right because i should have looked at the guys <laughs> yes. so, so so they leave they you know they tell him oh it'll be fine and up comes uh the parking attendant who if you noticed was just checking out of work right he was punching his time card so he was actually ending his work shift and he says oh i'll take the card car for you and so he play, he's he, he was by. about to eat the car or lick it you know he was just <laughs> Yes. drooling yes <laughs> yes and and uh, so th th that actor is, is is a guy that i like he's been in a few things including uh do the right thing with spike lee his name is uh richard edson and uh, you know he doesn't look like the kind of guy that you would trust with your priceless you know car but he's you know very you know oh no we'll take care of it the, the funny thing is that first ferris says to him uh do you speak english Right. And, right. Uh, and, and the guy looks at him and it says, well, yeah, what country do you think we're in? Right. So, again, for me, that showed kind of this, you know, head in the clouds, but also this sort of sense of entitlement and this sense of privilege that came across where this guy who looks vaguely ethnic in some indefinable way, you know, might not speak English. OK, so um, it was interesting. So, of course. Uh, the parking attendant takes the car his buddy jumps in and they go on a joy ride while, while ferris and his crew are a, really are off long one. This a very long <laughs> one which comes back to be an issue uh, later in the movie right so first stop is the top of the sears building where they look down on the city and again it's the highest point right it is the height of freedom and what they do is they kind of lean over so they can look through the glass and look down you know through the glass floor and see the city below them and all of these opportunities laying out um underneath them right so explain to me those two guys with those funny hats that were also looking down did you notice that it was like with really colorful hats like they were not hats that you would wear but it was like almost like a costume and that to me was like a funny kind of little detail that yeah. was also sevenish you know like wearing yeah. those kind of things so it's interesting i didn't catch that um but i do wonder if they were part of the parade right because there was a parade oh. going on there and maybe they were you know but they were wearing suits and then those uh -huh funny hats like costume yeah yeah <laughs> so, <both> missed that. <laughs> yeah right right it was good catch maria was eh? um yeah i don't know i mean i i don't know um you know it again it might have had something to do with the german day parade spectators and they're gonna you know maybe not in the parade but watching it but i i don't know i have to go back and watch it's good i was um, even caught by how um ferris got them to do that it it was such um oh lean forward Oh, do this, you know, isn't that great? And yeah. I think Cameron's, maybe it was Sloan said, the city is so peaceful from up here. And she then, did. yeah, she did. And then he says, anything is peaceful from 1,353 feet. And it's like they feel drawn to him. They want to kind of take what he's giving them. And so they yes. follow him. 
So they go from there to the mercantile exchange. They're watching the traders uh, on the trading floor and they're kind of mimicking them and, you know, just kind of hanging out and having fun. And Ferris turns to Sloan and says, hey, why don't we get married? And uh, she says, what are you crazy? And he says, no, what, you know, what's the big deal, right? What are you afraid of being the, you know, only married cheerleader and, you know, all these things. So Not having a place to live. Not <laughs> right. Minor thing. <laughs> yeah, what's the big deal, right? So, and, and you know, and, and it's interesting. This is one of the things I notice about sevens a lot of times is that talking about something is almost the same as doing it. Right. It satisfies that same need. So, of course, Ferris wasn't going to marry her that day. But even just talking about it was almost as fulfilling as actually doing it. It is that imagination is reality kind of feel. It, it's a weird, it's, it sounds weird, but it's really, yeah. it does happen. So uh, from there, let's see. Oh, so they go to a restaurant, a very swanky restaurant uh shaky and um of course they have no reservation everybody else is uh you know clearly well dressed in suits and all of these things the host looks down his nose and again another adult who is a real jerk right and a buffoon and uh, ferris impersonates uh abe froman the sausage king of chicago mm -hmm. So, so, and manages to get away with it. And manages. <laughs> <laughs> and, and knows he will get away with it. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, 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 and Cameron and Sloan are saying to him, Ferris, stop, you're going too far. And what does he say? Do you remember? You can never go too far. You can never go too far. And if I'm going to get busted, it's not going to be by a jerk like this. Right? So, again, it's this sort of act of rebellion in a way and this um this lust for life it's at this point where um first of all they almost get caught by his father because ferris's father happens to be eating at the same restaurant and again the father kind of a buffoon yeah and when they managed to get out of the restaurant i don't know how they paid by the way but um yeah. <laughs> when they managed to get out of there without being seen by his dad he says something like the bold survives and you know and that boldness is kind of what i see in sevens that he didn't feel that way he was but but he didn't feel like that to me yeah so i often see this sort of insecurity you know inside of the seven overridden by this convincing themselves of no go do it right so it's yeah. like this this thought overrides the emotional fear that they feel you know well it kind of leads to feeling like a sense of immunity that nothing is going it's teflon nothing's really going to be a problem here yeah. because of that self-convincing that goes on and so then you it, it almost comes to pass not yes. always, but yes. more than one would think, as we saw with him. Yes, yes. And Ferris gets away with everything, right? That's, you know, the, the, the sort of the theme there. Now, while all this is going on, Dean Jones pays a visit to the Bueller household to try and catch him in the act. And again, things go wrong. I mean, every horrible thing that happens to him happens. He gets attacked by a dog. He's, you know, gets stuck in the mud, you know, the, all, all these sort of things. His car gets towed and, you know, so forth. Now, little movie history about this character, which for me, knowing this made it tougher for me to watch the scenes with Dean Rooney. Uh, the character, the actor Jeffrey Jones has been in a number of things over the years, including playing uh, a central character in one of my favorite series ever, Deadwood, from HBO. He was arrested for enticing a teenage boy to pose nude for pictures. Okay. And, um, you know, it kind of ruined his career. And he, after that, had to register as a sex offender and would move around and not register. So he got arrested a couple of more times. And, you know, there's this creepy sort of backstory to this character. And I was reluctant to even bring this up. But when you understand this, for me, it makes those scenes of Dean Rooney snooping around the house to chase a 17 year old boy. Uh, a, a little bit more, shall we say, vivid, right? Um, 
<laughs> it felt so insane. <laughs> so, so insane and creepy and and uh, disturbed and all these things. Okay, so uh, now that said, uh, you know, John Hughes said to Jeffrey Jones, you will be remembered for this role for the rest of your life. Okay, and that came to be true, even though he was in a lot of other things. This is the role that people remember him for, because it was a very vivid, iconic role uh, in the film. Okay. Rio, is a comment? Oh, I'm still thinking about your <laughs> anecdote. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, even yeah. his sister, I think, at this point said something like, uh, why should everything work out for him? What yes. makes him so goddamn special is what she said. Screw yes. him. Yes. Yes. And uh, so she sets out to catch him, right? In the meantime, let's see, uh, Dean Rooney uh, leaves the house. You go ahead. Yeah, before he even goes to the house, it was interesting to me to see where he looked for him. Yes. He looked yes. for him, um, assuming that he would be playing kind of video games or that he would be at a creepy bar or eating young kind of a food. a pizza place, yeah. Yeah. So, and he never would have thought that he was eating at that restaurant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So it, it was interesting how he underestimated the kind of things that uh, Ferris was interested in and how he was enjoying his day off. And, and again, this, this, this theme of underestimation has come up a number of times, right? And I think, too, that's something that people often do with sevens, is to underestimate their intelligence Right. There's this sort of uh, belief in a lot of the Enneagram literature that sevens are superficial and they don't finish things. And, you know, they're they're not disciplined enough to develop expertise in something. So people, in my experience, often underestimate sevens because they're sort of they mistake this sort of light, you know, surface affect in them as a lack of substance. And even elements of uh, aesthetic uh, sense. Mm -hmm. Or uh, he here he was at a very expensive restaurant, maybe some sense of underestimating sophistication and elegance that mm -hmm. uh, is appreciated by the sevens. Yes. Uh, or yes. Tom, anyway. Yes. And so, um, so they flee the restaurant and they end up at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is, frankly, this was my favorite scene of the movie. Me okay. too. Right. And um, the, the reason is, number one, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful museum. It's one of the best in the world. And I've been there a couple of times. And they slow down, right? This is where all of a sudden Ferris stands still, right? In every scene, except for the, I think there's one scene of them walking kind of hand in hand with other kids. There's this beautiful music playing, right? Which, again, was very different from the rest of the music through the movie the movie was actually called it was a, an instrumental remake of a song by the smiths called please 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 let me get what i want okay <laughs> now if if that's not a seven movie i mean a song title i mean come on right uh which i just thought was fascinating because i'm sure john hughes didn't you know didn't say hey i'm gonna make a seven movie here right it just kind of came out so again captures that theme but for me, you know, we talk about the seven and learning to savor things. Right? And that's what was happening in the, in the art museum. I'd say something about that. Oh, I tell you, um, I watched this twice. And both times I was so moved, not to tears, but very deeply emotional because of the tenderness and the depth of every one of them. And what I noticed when I watched it the second time each of the three of them were standing in front of a painting, and each painting was a human being or a family. They weren't some kind of just graphic art. They were people. And then they would get so drawn into it. And I felt that. I felt that depth of, of tenderness. I, I know of sevens in myself and others that really likes belonging, likes a connection, likes something that is meaningful. And I think that goes to your earlier point. It's something that I think is not always seen 
in sevens and sevens don't always help you see it. So there's a scene where um, Matthew Broderick and uh, I'm sorry, where Ferris and Sloan have kind of a romantic moment in front of uh, there's a, a Chagall installation there of stained glass. That's quite beautiful. And um, then they cut to Cameron who is mesmerized by the Surratt painting um Sunday afternoon in the park, something uh, like that. I forget exactly the title, and it's an uh, it's an impressionist painting where uh, actually a pointillist painting, and he gradually they he, you know they cut to his face where he is just enraptured with this painting, and then they zoom in on the picture more and more and more to the point where it's just dots on the page, which is quite fascinating. Um, but again, for me, um, uh, this represented this ability when sevens are able to slow down and to be in the moment and be present and savor is when they're at their best, right? When they are, you know, um, um, most at peace, most comfortable and, and most inspirational even to others. And oddly enough, when they first... Uh, released to the test screenings of the movie, that scene got really bad feedback because it came after the parade scene, right? So they had this parade scene, and then they go to the museum, and there was different music in it, and people just hated it, right? But John Hughes was, you know, he he said he wrote that scene as his own self-indulgence because he loves that museum so much. He said, so I'm going to make this work. They moved it up in the movie, change the music. And again, I think it's one of the most effective scenes in the movie. But then they go to a German pride parade or a German heritage parade where they are, you know, lost in the crowd. They feel like Ferris ditched them. Cameron is getting really frustrated. He ditched us. He's selfish. He's only about him, you know, what he wants. They're talking about how they don't know what they want out of life. Everything works, you know, great for Ferris. They say, you know, what do you think he's going to be when he grows up? And they say a cook, a uh, short order cook on Venus or, or something, right? Um, again, just to show this idea of possibilities and, you know, uh, for, for Ferris. But then they find him. And what is he doing? He's dancing. Um, he's talking to them, or like dedicating something to them. And uh, on top of these, what do you call them? Float. It's a parade float. Yes. Yeah. And starts singing and dancing. Yes. And everybody's. Uh, and I think this is the, I mean, it's really hard to believe. All the rest I could buy, but that was just too much to me. But but the fact that he gets everybody dancing, you know, he gets everybody energized and to follow him. Although he was clearly not part of the show, not in the agenda of the event. Of the event, but um, yes. everybody loves him and followed yes. him and dances with him. And when I stepped back from just what he was doing and watched the crowd, the amount of joy and enjoyment and good feeling and enthusiasm, dancing, everybody of any age and stance in life was, was involved and engaged. And I realized that kind of speaks to the human need to have what he instigated and inspired. Yes. yes. It just rippled. Yes, yes. Ferris basically takes over Chicago at this point, right? Um, and uh, you know, and you know, construction workers up on the up on the scaffolding are dancing. Now they did not look like actors to me; those guys up there, uh, you know. So I think that was, you know, a spontaneous sort of thing. And, and if this was the budget of the movie uh, that you said five minutes, it's probably they just used a lot of people that were just there. They they did an open call. Right, uh, put something in the newspapers and radio and all that sort of stuff, saying, "Hey, we're filming this parade scene. Anybody that wants to come down and dance, come down." And they got about ten thousand people show up uh, for that, and and they're all dancing in the streets. Now, first of all, Ferris sings the song Dankeschön, which is was made famous by Wayne Newton. Uh, it was kind of his signature song, but Dankeschön means you know, thank you very much in German, and it's this. It's, again, this gratitude yeah. that sevens often exhibit of, you know, life is good. And I'm just, you know, I'm so thankful 
for all the wonderful things that happened to me. Right? I, I noticed this in my, you know, my seven wife and my seven sons. This, you know, how they they're so touched by the simple kindnesses in life, right? Because they see the joy in them, they see the beauty in things. Uh, and then he goes from Donkashone to Twist and Shout, uh, the, the Beatles song. Again, John Hughes, big Beatles fan. There were a number of Beatles references. I will also say that Donkashone is, is throughout the movie. It's the song he's singing in the shower at the beginning of the movie. And even Dean Rooney is singing Donkashone at one point when he's kind of singing to himself. So. You know, I don't know what to make of that, but it's, a, a, again, a, 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 an ongoing theme for the movie. Let's see. Twist and shout. Everybody breaks out. Again, this exuberance happens. They uh, go off uh, from there. And I think it's at this point they say, you know what? We better head home okay, after the parade. Now, we left out Wrigley Field. I'm sure, you know, the catching a baseball game, which, again, you know, doing all these things in one day is just, you know, of course, impossible. But... It again speaks to this seventh thing of, you know, hey, we could do everything and don't worry about how long it's going to take and don't worry if it's practical or not. Let's just do it and see what happens. And it's going to be great. You know, we're going to go from one thing to another and there we are. What was right. amazing to me was to see in the stadium this save fairies, you know. Yes, save, save. yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's Which, everywhere. <laughs> Yes, which we didn't even talk about yet, right? So at school, while he's, you know, out sick, faking being sick, everybody thinks that he's got this fatal disease. They start raising money for him. It's in the newspaper. For a kidney, for a kidney right? On the uh, uh, the sign at Wrigley Field, it says, Save Ferris. They're um, in the newspaper when his father's in the car, in the taxi. It says, you know, community raise comes together for a sick local boy or something like that, right? So, because everybody just loves Ferris, right? You know, it's just he's this, you know, likable, engaging guy. <laughs> Are you interested in learning more about our approach to the Enneagram? Go to awarenesstoaction.com and check out our certification program. We offer a clear, concise, business-friendly, and science-minded approach while maintaining the depth of traditional approaches to the system. At Awareness to Action International, we're the leading innovators in the theory and pragmatic applications of this system to all aspects of the work environment, including leadership and personal development, team building, diversity and culture, and managing change. However, this approach is not just for the business world. A lot of people who attend our trainings do so for their own self-development or spiritual growth. Our certification program is one of only a handful of curricula accredited as a school by the International Enneagram Association. So they decide it's to go start heading back. They go back to pick up the car. Combines live just sessions with asynchronous the, uh, learning. Car attendants come Again, back find from out their more at awarenesstoaction.com. We're speeding through you know, greater Chicago, where we get to kind of a turning point in the movie because this car that Cameron's father loved so much and protected so much and meant more to him than even Cameron did, had only or about, wife. or his wife, <laughs> had, I think, what, about 120 miles when they left. And, you know, the, the solution was going to be they were just going to drive the car backwards. And uh, that would that would take the miles <laughs> off the odometer. Right. Um, but they realize as they're driving back that these guys went out and drove about 200 miles. And so now they're really freaking out. Cameron, in particular, is losing his mind. So they are they jack the car up on a, a tire jack uh, back at Cameron's house and they start driving, you know, running the car in reverse, right? Trying to get the, the miles to go off and they go into the swimming pool, right? And so this is an interesting scene. So again, we have something, uh, uh, we, if we recall back to Jerry Maguire and this theme of baptism, right? Uh, that ran mm -hmm. through the Jerry Maguire movie. We get again, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but it's Cameron coming back to life, right? Baptism represents a rebirth, a new life, and they're all in the pool. Cameron is sort of catatonic, or at least he's deep in thought, pretending to be catatonic while Sloan changes her clothes, apparently. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, so he decides to kind of throw himself into the pool. Cameron, and they think he's trying to commit suicide. So uh, Ferris dives in to save him, drags him out of the water, and we realize again that Cameron has been reborn, which again I thought was a beautiful scene. Right? It's this yeah, he's of, just uh, fed up of his dad not treating him well or 
I don't want to say abusing him, but being and, yeah, aggressive and not loving. Mm. Yes. And mixed with that, you see kind of speaking of sobered moments for uh, Ferris, yes. where he shifted out of the, oh, having a great time to, oh, my gosh. And the seriousness of caring about his friend, mm -hmm. it, it was a very big shift. And, yes. and an equal part of what Seven's experience. Yes. Going from that Peter Pan sort of quality to, hey, wait a minute. Okay? Life is real. Life has consequences. There are things that are important. And again, it's not that Sevens don't get this, right? I mean, they, they, they understand. But they can kind of switch back and forth uh, very often. So the, um, the rolling back of the odometer is not working. Cameron freaks out a bit more and decides, you know, he's going to take it out on the car. So he starts kicking the car again, which represents his sort of rebellion against the father, his standing up for himself. The car goes shooting out of the back of the garage over the cliff and smashes. Uh, right? And so it's interesting here because Ferris says, we can blame it on me. Right? You know, he doesn't he kinda, like me anyway. Yeah, he doesn't like me anyway, right? So, you know, let, we'll just say I did it, okay? Which is very nice, you know? I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, I guess it's only the right thing to do, but also it was kind of sweet and, you know, courageous and brave for him to do that. But Cameron says, no, I'm going to deal with this. I'll, I'll stand up to him and, and so forth, okay? And at this point, he realizes it's almost 6 o'clock and he needs to get home before everybody else does. And it starts this chase, everybody heading back to... Ferris's house at the same time. Ferris is racing through backyards, eluding dogs, jumping over uh, women who are sunbathing in the yard, uh, which. <laughs> and then stop and introduce himself. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. Right. laughs> and sees his dad again on the street for the third time in the yes. day and manages yes. to get away with it again. <laughs> right. Right. And, and it is the great scene. He runs past these two women and, you know, again, his life is on the line and he stops by and says, hi, I'm Ferris Bueller. How are you? Kind of thing. Right. So uh, great, dinner is served or dinner is ready when he <laughs> smells good. <laughs> <laughs> and lets people know that dinner is ready. <laughs> yes, as he's racing through their house, right on his yes. way home. Uh, now we we kind of left out the part about the sister, uh, you know, beating up Dean Rooney, uh, thinking he's an intruder, kicks him in the face, uh, calls the police about the intruder, has to go to the police station where she meets Charlie Sheen. Yeah, because the police doesn't believe her. I mean, they don't right. believe her, and they they yes, yeah, get her. <laughs> yeah, she's telling the truth and nobody believes her ferris is lying about everything but everybody believes him um again which causes her rage she kind of gets this little crush on the biker drug addict um, uh, charlie sheen character and he he's, does this moment of psychoanalysis on her right where he says to her you know uh, you know, why are you so fixated on your brother? You need to spend some time with you. And I know somebody maybe you should talk to. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me it's Ferris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know yes. him? <laughs> yeah, what she says to him is, say the name Ferris Bueller and you'll lose a test. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he says, oh, you know him? <laughs> so, so even here, she cannot escape how everybody loves her brother, uh, Ferris. So Ferris makes it home. He gets away with it. He um, he fools his his parents into believing he was sick, and kind of you know we would think lives happily ever after okay, in the movie. Right? Dean Rooney does not have the same luck. Okay, um, he <laughs> his car gets towed. He's beaten up. He loses one shoe. He is shuffling down the street when the school bus comes along. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the school bus driver stops to offer him a ride home as the credits are going. Uh, he gets on the bus. It's filled with students. There's only one seat on the school bus. <laughs> so <laughs> he sits down with the... Um, the girl who's clearly the girl that nobody else wants to sit with on the bus, who who offers him a uh, gummy bear. <laughs> it's it's warm, yeah, warm. Yes, <laughs> but it's warm because it's been in my pocket, so it's warm. <laughs> and he takes this gummy bear, throws it away. Then, uh, right, he does throw it away at another kid. Okay, so um, and then finally, uh, the movie ends with 
Ferris, you know, walking out of his bedroom and saying to everybody, why are you still here? Go away. Movie's over. It's done. Yeah. At some point, uh, I think somebody asked her, him if the day was as he expected, and he said it was 150% better. Yes. <laughs> it was yes. something about kind of a bit of exaggeration and making things in their minds like even better and more exciting than they were. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, every time we go into these one, one of these podcasts, I always ask myself, geez, what are we going to talk about? And, uh, you know, this will probably be a 30 minute time. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, but then at the end. Yes. The camera still kind of it's uh, recording and he says, are you still here? It's over. Go home. He says. Yes. And it's about kind of like i entertain you enough now leave me alone yes yeah very good very good point and so say why that's significant Rioze. because it's like you might think that sevens like that role all the time and they don't it gets tiring they uh, it's exhausting and they want to just go home go to their room and just be alone and it's this five-ish thing. It's like detached, detaching because it's like to refuel as well. And because otherwise it's just impossible to keep up with being like that and feeling like I have to entertain you. Uh, all, when, if I'm with you, that's my role. Yes. Like I've had enough. Leave me alone. Yes. That is such a good comment, uh, Maria Jose. It, and you know, he said earlier, I did all these things for you. I, what do you mean? We've, we've done this and this and this. And yeah, at the end, okay, I'm, I'm done now. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Leave me alone. I've entertained you. Right. right. Uh, I've, you know, I'm, I am spent and I want you to go away <laughs> is, you know, is, is the message there. So, uh, yeah. So again, uh, you know, uh, not Citizen Kane, the movie, right? Uh, uh, but you I keep, think if you keep comparing every movie to Citizen Kane, I didn't like Citizen Kane. Well, so that it's... just, you know, that says more about you than Citizen I Kane. Know. But, you know, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so it's not The Godfather. How's that? Today? Okay, so, that's better. All right. Yeah, okay. So it's not The Godfather. But, uh, you, know, you know, again, I think if you watch it with the, you know, tuned into the nuance and the themes, it's really quite a sweet and engaging movie. So uh, I, I recommend first Bueller's Day Off for uh, our listener and uh, who might want to watch the movie. So um, one thing we didn't talk about were the subtypes, right? So we usually talk about them. You know, we touched on it a little bit. I don't think the subtypes were that vivid in the movie. Um, we already said that uh, he kind of, you know, was written like a transmitter maybe, but played more like a navigator. So there's a little bit of that. Certainly not a lot of preserving going on in the, uh, <laughs> no. uh, you know, right? So... So, uh, any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Oh, I think I enjoyed the podcast more than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was awful long, I'll tell you that. Yeah, so go ahead. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, but, but, you know, when... So, it's when people ask me, so why do you pick these movies? And because they're older, why don't you pick new movies? And But they think that... The fact that the whole movie, the whole theme, and the uh, the songs, and uh, all these details help us see things that relate to one particular type, in this case, seven, just hard to find. And this one does a really good job at that. Yes, yes. Becky, any questions? Well, and, and by keeping the stereotype judgments out of it, you know, noticing those, but moving in our own minds beyond that allowed me to see the nuance and the complexity and how sevens can show up in many, many ways. And if we're looking for it, we'll find it. Good. One thing uh, it came to mind was that, that we did not mention was the song, Oh Yeah. When when Ferris first sees the Ferrari and that song, that techno song, Oh Yeah, comes on, it, boy, is there ever, ever more of a sevenish song than that, right? He looks at it and says, you know, it's that, oh yeah, and, you know, kind of thing, and that techno beat. So that song was made by a a Swiss 
techno pop duo uh, called Yellow. And it appeared in a couple of movies and it's been in a million commercials and it gets played at sporting events. And those two guys who wrote that song have made so much money off of that song since it first came out. But again, boy, does that capture seven, right? That song that we did it. So mm-hmm. I would agree with you, Maria Jose, everything in this movie spoke to the qualities of what it means to be mm-hmm. a seven or what point seven represents on the Enneagram. Well, one other thought I noticed when I stepped back and just took it all in, there were the vividness of color throughout the entire movie, bright reds, bright colors, many things that, that were very stimulating. And yeah. there was nothing dull or gray. Yes, yes. Good. Yes, there was not a relaxing moment, uh, you know, I mean, or a, a, a non-vivid moment in the movie. Okay, well, Becky, thanks for joining us. It was great to have you, um, you know, particularly because of your seven perspective here, but uh, you brought a lot to the podcast. We really appreciate it. Maria Jose, um, you know, we have, I think, a couple more we're planning to do in this series. We're going to do an honorable mentions podcast uh, in the near future where we're going to talk about some movies that you know didn't quite rise to the level of being as illustrative of the type that we would have liked to but that we think show some interesting dynamics particularly about some of the subtypes okay so yeah. uh, that will be coming up as well as a uh, a conversation with our friend tj daw who is a uh, a really interesting guy he's a monologuist a creative consultant script writer big big movie buff and um you know a, a student of the enneagram as well so looking forward to that conversation as well so thank you everybody for joining us and we will see you on the next episode of the enneagram and the movie podcast Thank you for listening to the Enneagram in a Movie podcast, part of the Awareness to Action podcast network. Find out more about the Enneagram and our offerings at awarenesstoaction.com. And if you enjoyed the episode, please go online and give us a review. We'll see you next time.